Hello, I'm JW. This time I'm going to have a look at AFDDs again, and I've got one here from MCG. So we're going to have a look at that one. I'm not actually going to power this up this time because uh, this one is supplied with some useful information. So I'm going to have a look at that and also how that might apply in terms of these things generally. And also have a look at the uh, device we've got here. Now we will be powering this one up at a later date along with plenty of others, but uh, for now we'll just have a look at the details here and see how these things generally are supposed to work, what kind of faults they're supposed to detect, and why you might want to install them. So this comes in this uh, fairly large box here, and uh, in terms of the dimensions of it, it's a single module, as in single module wide, but this one is actually a tall module, similar to the uh, older type RCBOs that you uh, could get, in fact can still get from some places. So just take it out of the box there. So uh, fairly usual kind of arrangement here, line in at the bottom, neutral in via the flying lead, so that's about 12 inches long or so there, so fine for a consumer unit but not necessarily for a large distribution panel. And uh, circuit wiring connection on the top here with the line and neutral connections there, just the two terminals in the top, and of course clips onto the standard rail there at the back. So all uh, pretty much uh, what you would expect there. And have a close look here at the front. So on the front here we've got, this is a, a B32, so it has the normal circuit breaker function there for overload and short circuit. A 30 million RCD is built in as well, and uh, this has a test button for every six months, so that again for the RCD component. LED indicator here, so that will light up uh, and uh, flash also depending on where faults have occurred. And we also have a mechanical indicator there, so in the case of this it's green in the off position, and uh, red in the on position, and a small legend here with 0 and 1 for the two positions, and then uh, it's got this symbol here with a flame. Now, you would assume that that implies that it's going to prevent fires from occurring, and not the case that when it's turned on it sets on fire. So uh, anyway, it's got that on there as well, and uh, not much on this side apart from a uh, the label here which says uh, disconnect those before carrying out insulation test. And yeah, this is fairly common on these things and also RCBOs as well that uh, if you shove 500 volts uh, into the electronics it doesn't work very well after that. On the side here we've got the uh, actual stripping length for the conductors and also the tightening torque, so again fairly standard there, 2 newton meters there, 14 millimeter length for the incoming line at the bottom. That would normally be a solid uh, bus bar stab there, but uh, nevertheless two newton meters there. And at the top, similar again for the outgoing conductors, so in this case 12 millimeter length and 1.2 newton meters of tightening torque required. If you're wondering why torque screwdrivers and tightening things to specify torque has suddenly appeared, well the simple reason is it's manufacturer's instruction. So the manufacturer specifies that this needs to be tightened to 1.2 newton meters, so therefore if you're going to install this and comply with the manufacturer's instructions, well you're going to need to get a torque screwdriver and tighten it up to the specified torque, because if you're not, then you're not complying with the manufacturer's instructions. And this is also why you don't have to use torque screwdrivers on things like sockets or switches or whatever, because uh, manufacturers don't specify a tightening torque for those things. Or at least they don't at the moment. I mean, obviously in the future, anything could happen, couldn't it? And C mark there. And then we've got the standards here that's made to, so uh, 61009-1, that's for the RCBO part and the RCD there, and 62606 is the standard for the arc fault detection part. And uh, as we've seen with the others of these we've had before, although they're all made to the same standard, the way that they're actually implemented in the sort of things like the software and whatever are going to be different between various manufacturers, so although it's the same standard, there are differences between these. And the other thing with these standards is, well, that these standards are not set in stone forever. These can and quite often do change. In fact, this particular one here, the 62606, there's already an amendment in the works for that. So uh, not been out that long, but being amended already. Now this one comes with a variety of these uh, documents here. Just have a quick look at some of these. And this is more the sort of sales leaflet here. You can buy this from uh, CEF. This one's priced £150, basically, plus VAT. And so that makes it uh, more of a cheaper version than some of the others we've seen, which are typically around the sort of £200 mark. Although, of course, none of these things are particularly bargain basement, certainly at the moment. And comes in the pretty much uh, usual values you expect from 6 to 40 amps in type B and C. So all uh, pretty much the same deal there. Now let's have a look at this uh, information it comes with now. 
a lot of this we have seen with other manufactured devices because of course same standard it's going to have a similar kind of performance there but uh, this is actually provided with it so actually it's combined it's got the three things within the same device so arc fault detection the circuit breaker and the rcd and uh, each one of those parts will detect different types of faults so a short circuit and overload is covered by the circuit breaker there they're pretty much standard as you've seen before Residual current device, so uh, any kind of imbalance between line and neutral, greater than the uh, 30 milliamps in this case, will uh, trip on that one. And the RCD part will also do parallel arcing faults between line and earth. So in that case, uh, that's actually going to detect a fault there as an arc, but not because it's an arc, just simply because that there's going to be that imbalance between the line and neutral again. And then, of course, the arc fault detection is the series arcing and the parallel arcing which we've seen previously. Series arcing being by far the most common. That's where you've got a damaged conductor, so it's basically a break or a partial break in a conductor, and it's in series with the load, so it's either breaking the line or the neutral. Parallel arcing is also a thing, however, that's between two conductors, and so we've seen here, if it's between line and earth, the RCD is going to pick that up, assuming it's going to exceed 30 milliamps, and uh, if it's parallel between line and neutral, unless it's a rather bizarre circumstance where you've got some damaged insulation and it's high resistance and it's enough arcing to cause it sort of to overheat. It's either going to be detected by the circuit breaker, so a short circuit there. So it's really things that are not a short circuit or an overload, but there's enough stuff there for the arc to be detected in the region of a few amps or so. So series arcs are most common, parallel arcs they exist, but uh, certainly not the most common there. Now over here we've got the block diagram. This is actually printed on the side of the device as well. I'll look at this because it's printed a bit larger. And we've got the sort of three uh, detecting elements here. So line in at the bottom here, neutral in via the flying lead, circuit wiring at the top, neutral and line there. So we've got the more traditional circuit breaker element here for the overload and short circuit. Here's the actual disconnection point here. And then we've got the two modules here, which will be electronic, uh, residual current device and the arc fault device. Both of those go in and of course will trip the mechanical uh, switch there if a fault is detected. Uh, we can see that the line in is therefore disconnected from all of the electronics and everything else once that has been tripped. Uh, test button here just between the uh, line and neutral across the RCD coil. Again, pretty standard for any RCD there. Just apply that tiny resistance across to create an artificial imbalance. Now the RCD module here has the detection coil of course around the line and neutral so it can uh, basically monitor the current there. Normally that should be zero, and if that exceeds a certain level, it of course will trip. Arc fault device here, only according to this, has detection coil around the line conductor only. Now, uh, whether this is the case in others isn't clear, because they uh, didn't tell anybody, but uh, is this going to matter in that it, does it need to detect arcs on both the line and the neutral? Well, maybe, or maybe not. Now, think about it, if the line current uh, coming in here and returning by the neutral, that's on half the wave and on the other half it's coming back this way. If it's a series arc, in other words it's a break in one of the conductors somewhere, then in theory it should be detectable on the line only because ultimately the current's flowing through, going through the arc and coming back and going through the arc as well. So it's either going to be detectable at least on one half of the waveform and that's changing uh, obviously 50 times or 50 hertz there. If it's a parallel arc, again, a similar thing is going to occur because it's going to be between these two conductors at some point. So current comes through here, goes through here, and then you get the arcing coming back. Current comes through here, arcs across, and you get it coming back this way. So in theory, it should detect it perfectly well with just one of them, although whether that's the same in all manufacturers, again, isn't known at the moment. And the important thing to note with this device is that it is a single pole only in terms of the switching, so the line is disconnected, neutral is connected solidly through, so this would not be suitable for use on a TT installation because neutral remains connected all the time. However, perfectly fine on a TN installation, so TNS or TNCS, but do bear in mind this is switching in the line only. Now we can see here the uh, arc fault detection device uh, operating criteria. So for a series arcing fault, that's basically a break in a conductor in a series with a load, Test current here, anything from 2.5 to 40, and the maximum allowed tripping time. Now, as we've seen before, arc fault detection devices generally do not work at very low current. So in that previous video we did with that lamp, we couldn't get it to trip. 
and that's because the uh, current there was too low. So at a current of two and a half amps, the maximum light tripping time is one second. Now in terms of time, this is actually quite a long time because traditionally things like circuit breaks and RCDs, it's always been about tripping as quickly as possible and getting rid of it as fast as possible in various milliseconds. But arc fault devices are completely different in that regard in that in certain instances they do take a relatively long time to trip, in this case one second. 5 amp current is half a second and of course reducing as the current increases there. So uh, it's not an instant device. Anyway, these things have to analyse the actual waveform and the frequency of it and a whole load of other stuff, and then they will uh, disconnect if various criteria have been met. And then, say, certainly below about 2.5 amps, these things may or may not trip. It's not really defined in the standard to work at low levels like that. And the idea being there that uh, at a very low current, the amount of energy in the arc is going to be considerably less, so the risk of fire or whatever, of course, is very small compared to a large current where Obviously a dangerous arc could cause a fire very quickly. And over this side, a similar table here for the parallel arcing fault. Again, test currents from here, 75 to 500 amps. Day one, this is between line and neutral, so you're likely to get much higher currents here. Lowest we've got here is 75 amps. And uh, the thing here is the maximum allowed number of arcing half waves within half of a second. 12 here and then obviously reducing further so this is going to be quite quick 12 half waves is uh, still only a fraction of a second but again it's quite slow in relation to things like uh, say traditional circuit breakers what's of interest here and this is why parallel arc faults are not particularly common is that even at the lowest current here we're still looking at about 75 amps now this thing is a 32 amp device and uh, for a Type B, that should trip at around five times the current. But of course, up in the two, three hundred, five hundred amp range, this is going to be covered by the actual circuit breaker part. So again, the parallel arc fault part of this isn't necessarily going to be used that often, if ever, because certainly once you get into the higher levels of fault current, it's already covered by the circuit breaker part. Now, a quick look here at the indications on this. We'll have a look at these when we test this in another episode. But uh, this has just a single colour light, and it's question whether it's on permanently and we've got sort of one, two, and three blinks per second, or doing it continuously. And the uh, detected items in this case are overcurrent or residual current fault, so that would basically mean it's just tripped for the uh, things unrelated to the arc fault detection part. And again, that would mean normal operation. One is a series arc, so again, that's the most common. Two would be a parallel arc fault. Again, not over likely, certainly uh, at the uh, higher currents there. 3 is an over-voltage fault, so again that's voltage exceeding 275. And continuous blinking is an internal self-test has failed, so basically the device itself has busted. And the way that this and the others work is that there's a microprocessor inside the device which does the analysis of the actual AC waveform and detects whether the arc is occurring and that trips off. But then there's an additional one which is in there purely to make sure that the main processor is actually working doing its thing. If that detects that there's a fault or something's gone wrong with it, again, then it will uh, show this as a fault to indicate the device itself is no longer working. That's also why there isn't actually any test equipment for arc fault detection devices. You can't sort of like an RCD tester or whatever, you don't sort of plug it in and test it because the actual testing functionality is built into the devices rather than it being an external thing. Now, a quick look through the specifications of this specific item here. So it's 240 volts uh, rather than 230. Type A RCD. This particular one's 32 amps, but obviously others are available. And as we've seen there, single pole and neutral, so uh, not switch neutral like some of the others are. 30 milliamp per RCD there, and most of this is pretty much uh, standard stuff there. Neutral cable is 350 millimeters in length, and uh, made to those two standards we saw previously. Series arcing faults here, again this is more generic information, typically caused by a loose connection or a damaged conductor. In this arc fault condition, current flow is always lower than the operational load current. So this is quite important because, as we've seen there, it only trips on generally around 2.5 amps or above. So if you have a load connected that's less than 2.5 amps, then even if there was a damaged conductor, the reality is it's probably not going to trip, even if it was damaged and there was a bit of arcing going on. So if you, say, had a... 100 watt uh, appliance plugged in, say like a television or something like that, this device is not going to detect any kind of serious arc fault 
and it's not just this device, it's pretty much any of them, because they simply don't work at currents below around uh, two and a half amps or so. Vintage circuit breakers and residual current protected devices will not detect these faults either. And it says here AFDDs uh, will disconnect serious faults from two and a half amps. So uh, not the sort of thing you're going to want to use on every circuit in every installation. Certainly things like a lighting circuit, really no point in putting this on to detect serious arcing because most lighting now is LED and in a typical house, although you're going to might put a six amp circuit breaker in, in normal operation the load of lighting, even if it's turn on, it's only going to be an amp or two maybe. It's probably never going to get above the two and a half amps, so not a great deal of point there. Parallel arcing faults, uh, these are some damage to the insulation that prevents minimum contact between the two live conductors. MCBs or RCBOs may trip if the fault current is high enough, so seeing that if it's an RCBO or an RCD, faults between line and earth are almost always going to be detected unless the current flow is less than 30 milliamps. But let's face it, if there was a current flow of less than 30 milliamps between those two conductors, who would even care because it's going to do nothing? There's not going to be a heating effect really there. So your RCD function is going to cover parallel arcs between line and earth already. Not going to cover between line and neutral. However, again, between line and neutral, if you've damaged the insulation sufficient that those conductors are going to touch, most of the time there's going to be a very high current flow which will trip the circuit breaker. After all, that is their main intended purpose. So this really only occurs if you've got damage to the insulation, say, between line and neutral, and there's just about enough contact between it, so there's some thin whisker of wire, or the insulation has sort of overheated and melted a bit and gone a bit charred and black, so there's some conductivity there, but it's not enough to trip the circuit breaker either on a short circuit or overload, but it is enough to cause some kind of dangerous arcing there, and then in that case this thing... Uh, and others should detect that and disconnect. So theoretically possible, but in reality rather unlikely. Parallel arcing faults between phase or neutral and a protected conductor. As it says here, yes, it can. But ultimately it's the RC that's going to detect that pretty much every time, and that's going to be the case anyhow in any existing installation with an RCD and six-month test button. That's again for the RCD function only. So that's uh, yet another variation on the theme, this uh, MCG one, single module but a uh, tall size module and uh, only switching in the line there, neutral solidly connected. So uh, all very similar to others but of course in some ways uh, not similar at all. Now we are going to test this one on that uh, arc rig we have seen in a previous video and we're also going to test this alongside with some others on some different types of fault including some actual damaged cables and various other things. So. Uh, that will be coming up uh, later on, but uh, until then, thanks for watching.